Hello, everybody, and welcome to the True Commerce presentation on post-pandemic e-commerce in Ireland. Um, this is done in conjunction with our partner, GS1. Uh, welcome, Maria. Hi. Hi, Keith. How are you? I'm good, thanks. Um, thanks for, for taking the time to sit on this with us today. Uh, we particularly thought it was relevant to include you guys. Uh, we do lean on you quite a bit when it comes to uh, general market conditions and also in terms of guidance on, on how we should transform and, and share data along the way. So it's, it's always important to have you involved. And, and, and also, um, like that, as much as we get a context from the market, I think you guys get a, a, an even broader one. So it's, it's always valuable to get your, your input along the way. Yeah, and I'd uh, I'd reiterate, I suppose, uh, reflect that back and say, firstly, thank you very much for inviting us to to join you. Um, it's great because you've been a, a goal partner of GS1 Ireland for a very very long time, and I think the fact that we have had this partnership for probably now on say ten years uh, at this stage, um, there's a great I suppose symbiosis between the two organisations in terms of information sharing. Uh, and a big part, I suppose, of the, the partnership from a GS1 perspective is that educational remit that, you know, bringing information on best practices to the market, updating people on trends, what's happening. And obviously, you guys have a great overview of what's going on in the market because you're, you're plugged into so many different organizations. So sharing that back with uh, your customers, with our broader GS1 membership, that's really helpful for, for the brands, the manufacturers, producers, distributors, for them to get an overview. And I think that you know dovetails very nicely into what we're going to take a look at today, uh, specifically around e-commerce trends and what's been happening over the last sort of 12 to 24 months, and maybe you know giving us a bit of a if we only had a crystal ball, but having a think ahead as to what's going to happen next and how people can best prepare for that in terms of maximising their success um, in the e-commerce space. No, absolutely, and um, like that, it, it's been really eye-opening for me to be honest and I think for everybody else along the way and, and I'm delighted today has actually got that that Irish focus to see how it's affected us and um, I, I do think we have a, a very interesting marketplace uh, very diverse in what we do um, and like where, where possible I do like to, to refine it down and like that through our our close relationship with GS1 Ireland in particular and, and like that with me being based over here as part of True Commerce um, it's always interesting to see how the market conditions are over here. Naturally, we take a lot of data from the UK as well and also further on into Europe. But um, it's the specifics of the locality that um, always makes it really interesting for me. And yeah, it, it, it's, it, it's nice to pull out that data and, and see how it's reflecting our direct customers today. I agree. So just, uh, I guess, as an overview of the, what we're trying to cover in our agenda today, uh, we're going to keep it quite broad. Um, but just try to cover as much as we can and um, so we're going to look at the, the foundations of e-commerce where Maria will will go through the GS1 uh, overview as to they, they have a, a, a pretty grand overview as to how e-commerce works and um, versus the traditional world I guess as some would think of it and um, but how, how they overlap as well and intertwine and um, we're going to have a look at the pre-pandemic e-commerce structure and, and, and uh, our experience there and um, also what, what happened then over the course of the pandemic and, and how it reflected within business. Uh, I'm going to look at some of those challenges along the way um, and also look at long-term digital strategy as well and, and how you can make the most of that in, in, in your own business. Thanks Keith. Um, so for those that aren't familiar, uh, GS1 Ireland is uh, a global standards body, uh, part of the GS1 global family uh, of, of standards offices that exist in each country. So we specifically look after the Republic of Ireland and members here. And traditionally, we're best known for the barcode. So, you know, the little barcode you see printed on products that you will you know buy in every grocery store, every consumer shop. Um, and really what we're looking at as an organization is how do we transition the standards, so the data standards, everything connected with the product from the traditional bricks and mortar uh, retail environment that we've all known for the last 20, 30, 40 years. How does that get reflected into the, the actual real world of today's uh, retail, today's supply chain where everything has gone digital, everything's available online and it's not just that business to consumer piece, but it's also business to business. Um, businesses have gone online. So really what GS1 about is, is how do we enable that transition? How do we help companies move into that digital space? 
And our, I suppose, key offering to the market is helping that process to be efficient and to be accurate through uh, identification. So product identification, if you get that part right, if you get your product data right and get the data sets right, uh, everything else is, you know, just that a little bit simpler because, you know, it's not an easy thing to do. So we're here to help organizations standardize their data, get it accurate and have that identification so that regardless of what platform provider, systems provider, data sharing provider, you, you probably have a rake of different partners that you work with um, across your e-commerce um, environment, across shipping, logistics and so on. So if you can get that data part right, um, it'll help bring all those systems together. So I suppose that's my main message for today. And what we're looking at is, I suppose, that bridging the physical and the digital world, uh, making that transition from the old retail uh, bricks and mortar store to the online world where consumers and, and, and business procurement officers are looking online for products. They're trying to compare and select. They're, you know, they're looking at pictures of products. They're comparing reviews. Um, they're facilitating the whole dispatch, distribution um, and possibly returns of product. So all of that is entirely data dependent. The entire supply chain runs on, on data. And that's why it's critically important. And we'll see throughout this presentation with True Commerce how all the different components and systems that you need to run all of those steps and activities is all entirely dependent on uh, accurate data and product identification. And to keep it very, very simple, um, at a GS1 level, that comes down to one one of many identifiers that we offer, but the GTIN or Global Trade Item Number, that is really, I suppose, the foundation for, for everything. Um, and globally, we are working on publishing this information, um, you know, and validating this information, just as core product data set so that anybody can check and validate a product. So over, I suppose, the coming months, and as you work with different providers around the e-commerce space, you will come back and see things referencing product verification or product identity verification. Um, so it's this seven attributes, the GTIN and six other descriptors, and that's really the core of what you're sharing with content providers that you're working with, any brand or websites you're working with, catalogs you're listing in and data sharing. So for me, I suppose the, the biggest takeaway from for you know from a GS1 point of view from today's pr presentation is to make sure you have your GTINs on your products and that the information is accurate. So I'll hand over to Keith now and he'll he'll talk us through, I suppose, what's happening in Ireland or what has happened. Um, and how this GTIN flows through the whole system. Thank you very much, Maria. It's uh, always quite informative to to get that background on it. I know quite often when it comes to certainly the, the, the old world, the traditional stuff, people can be frightened off by, by some of the terminology along the way. And uh, it, it's always important to try to simplify it down. Everybody does understand the barcode. Um, when it's used in the context of UPCs or GTINs and all, I think some people do get lost along the way. So it's, it's always nice to sort of just take that step back and say, no, this is what we're trying to talk about today. And here's here's how it's used. Um, and and like, like that, just to, to sort of get back to, to this discussion and, and, and look at the, the data. Uh, so underpinning all of this and, and trying to make decisions is always based on the data at hand. Um, so what we've tried to do is, is, is take that local data as well. So um, go down and, and notch on it and look specific to Ireland. How has this impacted and was the trends already in play or were they effectively created because of the pandemic? So we've taken all the way back to sort of 2019. And if we look at the, the online sales within retail in Ireland, um, they were already up 17 percent back in, in 2019. Um, so it was a way that businesses were going anyway. Um, we could see that ourselves. We, we sort of know through our own activity and purchases that we we're making online at that stage and how a lot of our, I guess, the brands and, and the retailers that we, we've known and trusted for years and years were starting to do an online offering. It was seen as, as an, an ancillary service or, or alongside, you know what, I can't get down. I'll, I'll just use the online. But it was intriguing to see how much was actually being used even at that stage on it. And to sort of play into that, Irish citizens themselves are early adopters in this stuff. Uh, we, we tend to get on board with doing it. And a lot of that might come down to actually geographic spread and, and, and sort of convenience of access to services. So being able to place orders outside of business hours and, uh, 
and, and, and in, at our own convenience on our mobile phones, etc., has played into that. And um, as we now know, everybody has a device typically on the end of their arm um, that allows them to go on, browse catalogs, look at products, look at reviews and, and place an order there and then. And yeah, it, it, it's all so, so important to put the most accurate data that you can in front of someone to allow them to make a informed decision. And when they've made that decision, you want to be the party that they place the initial order with as well. So don't allow them to consume your information on a product and then go off and buy it elsewhere. So getting in front of them and giving them a pathway to buy there and then is so, so important. Um, and then like that, 25% of consumer spending prior to lockdown was taking place on, online. It's actually a huge figure when we think about it um, in, in itself. So we, we, I guess, properly transitioned to the online world even before it was forced upon us. And those, those figures then during pandemic were always going to grow. So if we look at those trends, then what, what, what did happen during the course of it? So a huge increase of, of 159% in, in e-commerce revenue over 2020 for retailers. So that was the, the quick adaption within retail that uh, was forced upon a lot of businesses. They had to close doors. They couldn't trade as they did before. Um, but that, 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 I think that, that plays uh, into a, a lot of people's hands to say, well, we were prepared, we were ready to go. And as a result, we availed of, of those revenues early on in the pandemic. And 65% of the Irish population were bought at least one product online in 2020, which is absolutely massive if you look at the demographics on it. So it's, uh, it just goes to show that that's, the world has now taken it. They've seen how easy it is to do. They're not going to go back. Um, we might see with the opening of doors that people are quite happy to go back and go back to their ways of spending. I don't think they're going to cut out the online side of things. It's, it's the curiosity of it all. I think they'll go hand in hand for quite a period. So just goes to show the importance of having that digital strategy is that whilst you're, you're going to get your trade back through your traditional channels, do you really want to miss out on those other opportunities um, outside of traditional business hours? I would say a lot of businesses wouldn't go back. Um, and then there's a decrease of, of from 23 to 13 percent of people who have never bought online. And that's that was really important. I, I think it was quite obvious to a lot of people along the way as well. There'd be a lot of the, the population that were reluctant to use online for whatever reason, be it security, uh, just just not used to doing it. Um, and it was a case of when it's forced upon you and you see the ease of it, all of a sudden it's not so scary anymore. And that's how you want to do more and more of your transactions. And it, it, it's a big chunk of the marketplace now. So um, and, and I think a lot of businesses have taken that on and said, you know what, this is an area we need to have an offering in. So the acceleration of change, and um, this was data actually we pulled from our, our own consumers. So, so those that use the true commerce solutions, um, how can we use that data to sort of further inform ourselves? And it, it was quite informative to look at this graph in particular. So if we focus on the early part of the pandemic and, and businesses having to adapt to change for the first time and very immediately. So doors were unexpectedly shut in, in many ways um, around that sort of March, April time in, in, in 2020. And as a result, businesses had to find a way to get their product out there. So if you were a manufacturer that typically supplied to store, um, you had to find another route to market quite quickly. And I think that's why we've seen an immediate surge towards marketplace. It was seen as the easiest route to getting your product out there. So the big players in the market, the likes of your, your sort of Amazon, Amazons and Zalandos and, and whatnot will have picked up a lot of this trade because it was easy to publish your product detail there. Even if it was a, a manual process, it was you were able to do it without having to develop a platform for the very first time, advertise it, market it, get it out in front of people. People were already using the likes of Amazon anyway, and it was quite easy for them to find your product on it. In the background, we did see that e-commerce strategies were starting to evolve and that people were trying to do it directly themselves. And a lot of that comes down to the, the level of control you have by doing it yourself, I guess, when you're supplying it through a marketplace, sometimes you lose that touch point with your own consumers. They trust your brand. They trust um, what you do for them, what you've traditionally done for them over the years. You don't want to let them down. Um, and, and, and I guess having your own e-commerce platform gives you that level of control. So in the background, that was still growing just at, at, at a steadier rate rather than the sharp incline we see in our marketplaces. 
then it was, it, was, it was interesting to take a further step back and say, OK, over, over the course of a year, what does that look like? What was it? Was that initial offshoot of marketplace is something that was set to continue on for the year or was it always going to slow down? Interestingly, if we look at that initial peak that it had along the way and, and e-commerce growing steadily beneath that, after sort of August, September time, we started to see a much closer alignment as to, you know what, the, the trajectories are, are pretty much in line with each other from that point. Um, ebbs and flows along the way, as, as, as I guess more offering came onto the marketplace as well. So those, those early adopters in terms of businesses getting their product out there, availed of it quite well to begin with because they were in some cases the only show in town depending on the product um, as others came on stream then it came okay there's more competition here how do we get in, how do we I guess become the primary one on this and that's that's been the battle that we're starting to see now is who does online best and there's certainly some Irish retailers out there that are doing really really well online and, and there's others that have struggled along the way and, and are, are still getting to grips with it and I guess the, the, the long term game will be who adapts over the long term and, and, and who has the best offering then that, that people will stay with. Keith, I think the um, those last two slides in particular have been, you know, very interesting and kind of prompt a lot of thought for people to think about where they are on their own e-commerce journey. Are they, you know, still just at a very early stage do they have a website do they even have e-commerce capability on their website are they looking at marketplaces whether it's amazon or even directly through facebook and instagram and, and sources like that and i think you know without having a crystal ball um it would be very interesting to see where this trend continues do those two lines start to you know become closer and closer together as e-commerce you know starts to match uh, marketplace transactions will one take over the other um and perhaps i don't know if you have a thought you know should should businesses even favor one over the other or what sort of an approach should they take yeah it, it is the curiosity of it all and, and if we i guess if we if we could see that the end goal it, it would guide us one way or the other um, and, and i guess that's why they've been so close in terms of correlation with one another is that people are trying both and um, that way you will find what works best for your business and um, there's not putting all of your eggs into one basket i guess when it was just a pure bricks and mortar that's that's how we're we're, we're approaching and we don't do online it is a case of all your eggs in one basket some some businesses are phenomenally successful at it so if we look at the likes of, of primark or as we'd call them over here pennies they're phenomenally good at doing bricks and mortar and they didn't show that that initial interest to to getting into the online space maybe never will, um, it's not for every business, but a lot of the other businesses along the way found that it was a very successful way to get product out there. Some found that Amazon or the likes were really, really good for them and, and worked well for them, didn't meant that they didn't have to go out and build their own platform and support it. There's many, many plugins for Amazon out there today because it's such a popular marketplace. It's got an active, uh, an active audience out there as well that you can put your product out in front of. And then there's the likes of, businesses or brands that like that want to have that close touch point on their product or their customers and they don't really want to be going out and putting their products alongside competitors products they want to be a case of look come to our, our our store we'll guide you we we know what you like we know how to suggest to put it in front of you and we can also back that up then with the customer support that you're used to as well um and like that when we talk about marketplaces as well we shouldn't just focus on on, on, on the likes of amazon the likes of john lewis partners as well or phenomenally successful business online and and in store and like that a lot of producers would have provided into both and um yeah they're, 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 i guess it's horses for courses and and the only way to find what the best fit for your business is i guess is to dip a toe and try it out and see what works best for you and there's ways of doing that without getting completely washed away with it as well and i guess as a having it alongside your traditional business model has typically worked out quite well for a lot of businesses. Is, is that the, the data and the trends are suggesting that? And, and I guess that leads quite nicely into this as to do we see that businesses have tried out this online space? It, it's got over a, a hurdle, and, and effectively now we'll go back to doing what we do best. And um, we'll, we'll really know uh, that the feedback and the data that's been collected from businesses that have adapted to this way of working has suggested that 
no, you know what? We, we, we've tried this. We like this. We want to keep this alongside our traditional business offering. Um, we're never going to step away from what we did prior to, to the pandemic. But um, we've also seen the benefits of this. Um, we, we, we can see it as a, a working process flow in our business. And uh, yeah, uh, for a lot of businesses, it's been a way to, to grow. Maybe they were stagnating or, or, or at least just, just, just ticking along, whereas this has opened up some doors that, that maybe weren't there before. And, and it being trust upon you, yes, it's a scary thing, but it can also be the best way to adapt. So the short term solution, and, and, and this is what we, we typically saw in those early days when we could see that a lot of people were jumping on to using the likes of marketplaces as an easy route to market, um, was that they engaged the likes of an agency to do it. Um, challenges there, of course, where you, you're, you're passing off a bit of a control and your profits then are taking a hit as a result because you're paying it out as a, a, a third party is doing the work for you. But still, it it it. it, it it kept you getting your product out the door, which is the, the most important part then on it. Um, alongside that, I guess there was the guys that were a little bit more involved in their in their thinking or, or their, their processes, and they were, were, were managing it a lot more in-house themselves, and that allowed them to do both B2B and B2C offerings. Some people will only have one or the other. A lot of businesses now are saying, I can't afford to, to cut my nose off. I, I need to, to approach both, and um, my, my product offering fits in with both. So why would I not supply, supply out to a B2B customer as well as a B2C? Two very different service offerings, um, and, and it's something we cater for in, in both ways with True Commerce. Um, there's a lot of overlap in what they do, but very, very specific when you're targeting B2B customers and what they want versus B2C. The look and feel can be quite the same, but I guess how you approach it, how you want to interact with them is quite different. So, so some of the challenges, and, and I guess for anyone that's taking a late look into maybe a digital strategy or, you know what, they, 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 they rolled with the punches over the course of the pandemic, and now it's a case of take a breath and, and think about how we're going to do it longer term. A lot of those challenges along the way are expensive. Um, you learn a lot from them. Um, and, and maybe it's like it's nice to know up front as to, to what the likely challenges will be. And, and I guess from the, the data that we've collected back from our customers we, we can sort of point a few of those out so manual data entry if, if we even think about the traditional flow as to how difficult that would be if you're engaged with one retailer and you have a non-integrated edi solution and you're taking in orders there's a lot of manual effort of putting those orders into your back-end system then in case of getting the invoices raised and sent across to the the retailer as well if you extrapolate that out then as to, okay, we're, we're actually going to be supplying out to more than just one retailer. We're going to be doing it across onto our own website. We're going to be doing it across onto our partner's website. Oh, we're also going to be engaging with this marketplace. All of a sudden, everybody wants their data in a different way, um, a different structure, a lot of manual effort there beneath it all. So we, we've definitely evolved to have a solution then that copes with all of those. And, and the way we would always see it is, a business transaction is a business transaction. So if, if you're taking in an order from your marketplace, from your a, a retailer, um, direct from your own website, they're all just methods of taking in the order and we can pass them through to you in, in exactly the same way. So it's just how you approach these challenges, really. Um, high agency costs, definitely like that. When, when we seen that the initial trend was to go get an agency involved, they know the online world, we don't. We, we, we'll engage with them, we'll take their word for it. and um, yeah, it, it worked, it got people online quickly, um, but certainly it's a very expensive way of doing it just because you lose a little bit of the control along the way, you go with their suggestions on it, and uh, yeah, it'll get your product out there, but probably it's got to the point now where you want to start reining that in a bit, and you know what, Let's. I want to keep as much of that profit margin as I can um, to, to make this as sustainable as possible. Um, marketplace requirements, yeah, it's... It's a, it's a morphy world in many ways to, to get involved with it for the first time. So we're all aware of these marketplaces. They're all big behemoths. Um, but with that comes strict demands as to what you provide. Um, and I know the likes of GS1 use Jeetons with, 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 with Amazon. That's their view of a product as well. Very in line with the traditional world, but also their requirements in terms of what you're providing through to them is quite different because of the touch point with the consumer on the other end of things. So all of a sudden you're having to provide a lot of digital content, a lot of data. Uh, if you've got a technical product in particular, 
you're sharing a lot of technical information, sometimes certification along the way as well. Everybody that you deal with wants that in their format. Um, and it's a case of how do I keep up with that? You might struggle along, you might cope with the first request, put it into the format they want. If you've got a stagnant product set, that might work okay, actually. But if you've got a product set that changes quite often um, or needs to be updated quite a bit, um, but also going out into various different marketplaces and uh, retailers, the likes of a product manager or something really is worth its weight in gold and it allows you to effectively store all the characteristics centrally and export them in an Amazon format, a Zalando format. I need to connect it to my WooCommerce, my Shopify. We can, we can manage all of that and have a, a single point of reference for it. Uh, order management, again, going back to the manual side of things. So how, how do I stay on top of this? If I'm taking in numbers orders from, from different areas, how am I staying on top of it so that I have my stocks correct, that I'm processing them in a timely fashion? And uh, yeah, I'm not disappointing the consumer ultimately by having out of stocks and not being able to get the product to them. Um, so we can do that by trying to automate it as much as possible. So regardless of your back end system, uh, we work with every back office system for the most part. Uh, we will take your order in from whatever port of call it's coming in from and we'll deposit it into your back end system, leaving you to process it. Um, and then like that, if you need to share data outwards, we can facilitate that so that you can give inventory flows and the likes out to external websites. Um, high returns. So this, this actually popped up. I had a, a discussion with a, an educational body um, on the back of a, another GS1 uh, discussion point we, we, we had some months back. And it, it, it's a very accurate case of point as to for the guys that are stepping into this world for the very first time, are used to having bricks and mortar. Returns are just part of, of, of the course. Um, the numbers when we start looking at the online world are, are frightening as, as it goes. So if we look at, say, the likes of clothing online uh, and you can have a 50 to 60 percent return rate just because people aren't getting to have the touch and feel, aren't getting to try it on in store and the likes. It tends to be that consumers will buy product and return it because it doesn't fit. The, the fabric isn't as expected on it. How do we combat that? Well, the most effective way to combat it is to have the best quality data up front. And this again goes back to sort of the, the GS1 look on, on, on things and identification of the product is critical. It's key. And, and for me, it's, it's the most important way to stop that return rate is to put the best quality data in front of the consumer, allow them to make a valued and informed decision at the front end. And as a result, they're not going to be surprised by the product that arrives in the door. And we've seen a lot of the really big players, the likes of, of Nike and Adidas and the likes, have put a lot of time and effort into this. When you go on and select a shoe size, it will compare your experience with other products or other manufacturers to try and make sure that you pick the right product first time and they're getting less returns as a result. Um, product management, yeah, how, how do I manage a huge amount of SKUs? In, in some cases, if you're a manufacturer and you've got dozens and dozens of lines, and then within that, you've got a lot of bespoke characteristics about them that again, breaks it into more and more SKUs. It's really difficult to manage that. You're exporting this data out into so many different backend systems and, and being able to automate that with a product manager is so, so important. It's, um, yeah, it, it, it's, it's key really. And, and like that with the likes of GDSN, with GS1, it, it plays into it. It's something that hasn't taken us by surprise. It's not something we weren't expecting. It was important in, tra in the traditional world. It's absolutely vital in the online world. And yeah, we, we can assist with, with getting that data out there. And um, digital expansion. So, so yeah, expanding with the, the various channels that are go along the way on it. And we've seen that with the data in the, the previous graphs as well to say, look, I might just dip a toe. I might try Amazon and see how that works for me. Perfect. It, it's a good way to do it. I, I, I wouldn't say it, it, it's a bad approach at all. As it comes and as it evolves down the line and you want to get out into more and more marketplaces, open your product up, up, up to more and more um, territories or, or providers. Also have your own online um, or like that work with partners that have websites that could sell your product. It's, it's, it's allowing that flow in and out of their systems. And, and, and that's what we can work with you on. Uh, fulfillment, yeah. So ultimately we have to get this, this, this product out there. So capturing the order is one side of it. It's very much just tra transactional flow on it. Fulfillment then, how can we assist with that? And, and, and typically what is the experience? So the likes of pack and ship isn't going away. It's, it's evolving and, and, and we, we've seen more and more growth in that area. 
retailers are looking for that that endless oil philosophy effectively where they have a captive audience of consumers that have always used their brand trust it all of a sudden wouldn't it be nice if with our online offering if we could start offering products that we never have to have a touch point on order comes in via a retailer's website um, get sent to whatever provider of that product um, is, is listed that provider then ships it direct to consumer with the branding of that retailer. Retailer takes a margin of it along the way and everybody's happy. Manufacturer gets into a, a customer base that they were struggling to get into. Retailer gets a, a piece of the puzzle along the way and uh, you know, ultimately the consumer is satisfied because they've got more and more product offerings through someone that they trust. Um, development, so yeah, developing and, and, and maintaining that online presence because we're dealing with so, so many industries and parties along the way be it retail facing be it we're consumer facing and uh, we can give that guidance along the way and, and like that our product set is evolving along the way as well so the more and more feedback we get back from the marketplace allows us to change our product set or refine our product set i guess is, is the more important way of looking at it keith i think there, there's so much in that slide um you know and there's so many challenges what um you know, for, for anybody that's looking at it and going, oh my God, that I face all of those problems. Are there, you know, any one challenge or two or three or a group, you know, that maybe somebody should look at first? Are there ones that would have the most yeah. impact? Yeah, and, and, and for me, it's, it's a case of where there's challenges, there's rewards, I guess, is, is the ultimate way of looking at it. And, and product information, uh, going back to, I guess, your, your very first point on this is if we can identify the product we put ourselves in really great stead for, for tackling any of these challenges on it it's core to everything along the way on that previous slide actually so us being able to identify the product means that we can have an accurate listing on, on anybody's website as the order is placed then we use that identification so that the order placed out across into the fulfillment partner is accurate they know what they're fulfilling and um, so yeah for me the biggest thing is making sure you're in control of your catalog of products and um, that that's that's the cornerstone of it all really and um, we, we can assist with that gs1 can assist with that also um but it, it should here it may be daunting but it, it's not overwhelming is, is, the, is the approach i would take with it yeah slow and steady <laughs> yeah here it, it's everything's new when we try it for the first time and um, so the, the only thing we can really do is lean on those that have experience on it and with with True Commerce and with GS1, we have that in abundance. So reach out to us, speak to us, talk to us about what your challenges are. Chances are we can help you along the way with it. Yeah. I think that's a really good point. We are we are all here to help. Um, you know, do pick up the phone and, and just ask for a bit of help. Uh, certainly, as you said at the very beginning, you know, given the fact that it's kind of a very Irish focused webinar, we're notorious here in Ireland for for being here, for being helpful. Um, you know, and, and just keep asking. There's always somebody out there who'll have the answer for you. Yeah, and, and you know what? Chances are you're not the force is, 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 is always the reality of these things. And so 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 reach out, ask for a hand, and uh, yeah, you know what? Some sometimes a 30 minute call can save you an absolute fortune. Um you, you don't have to, to 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 be the first soldier down that road either. So try try find out, try get the experience of others. And um, certainly there, there will be others in your industry that have tried these things before. And it's a case of learning from from potential pitfalls there to try try avoid them yourself. Um, but yeah, I, I guess something that we've seen is, is those businesses that, that were prepared for it certainly hit the, go, the ground running. So if you had a, a pretty evolved digital strategy, you were in a really good place as it goes to pivot across from one to the other. If you had to start it for, for the first time and, and you're at a lower end of maturity, you're still finding your way. It was costing quite a bit up front because yeah, you had to put these systems in for the first point and, and like that you weren't used to doing it. So you you weren't sure where your, your margin was to be. Those guys that, that we're averse with it. it. It was all just a case of look, we're just going to channel more volume via our existing uh, offering. It, it was a lot easier to pivot across on it. But then when you look at those figures, you say, you know what, it's really attractive to have these channels available to us long term as well. So there's nothing to say being at that lower end of maturity, you can't get to that higher maturity quite quickly. Um, and, and like that, there's there's methods of getting there. Uh, speak to us, we'll, we'll get you there. So, so did, I guess this just echoes that again. So digitization as a barometer, in terms of your business health, our experience with these is the mature clients that had experience of, of, of trading online adapted the, the best to it. Uh, they've seen the biggest profit on the back of it. Um, but I guess those guys that were trying it out for the first time as well, 
have suddenly found that, you know what, there's, there's actually an option here. Maybe I was fearful of entering into it. It being thrust upon me has forced me to adapt and, and get accustomed to it. And what I've found on the other side of it is, you know what, it's not that scary. And, and what I've done is open up my product set to a new market, um, a market that's 24 seven. Um, I don't ever really want to go back because you know what, my, my business now has multiple ways of taking in revenues. That's critical. So a long-term digital strategy, and I know I've sort of thrown it in there a few times over the last few slides as to why it's important, what, why businesses are looking to have that, that longer-term view on it. Um, I guess now we have the data to suggest these aren't blips, these aren't just, um, oh, well, we got over this period of time, we can go back to the norm. Um, a long-term digital strategy really is worth its weight in gold in terms of the what it can do for your business in terms of both turnover and margin so what we're trying to do i guess is to adapt to the market forces that are in play and to make the most of them and and, and avail of them along the way we have this graph on on, on, on our, or this diagram on the right hand side effectively that breaks down what true commerce view our world as or your world as um, we have our strap line of do business in every direction and it's very much what we're trying to do as a business so I guess traditionally people would have known us as an EDI provider um, and we very much were. It was our bread and butter for many, many years. And um, EDI in its core principle is exchanging of transactions. So it was no surprise effectively that we adapted or added on additional facets to our business that allowed us to connect into the popular storefronts. We have adaption, uh, adapters and, and connectivity for Shopify and WooCommerce, really big platforms that allow people to get online quickly and cheaply. We also connect into all the big popular marketplaces. Um, your EDI hasn't gone away, it's still there. So all your connections with retail flow in through the same system. Um, and then there's the really sort of complex side of things with, with collaborative replenishment and VMI. And it's, it's another part of our business that we added on through acquisition. So all of these pieces have been added on either through development or, or acquisition um, we're, we're very sort of aware as to what our clients needs are because it's channeled to us on a regular basis as that happens we grow as a business we adapt um, in the same way all of these businesses out there have to adapt and um, so we're forever looking for the next trend what what, what are we going to be asked to do next how can we fulfill that for our customers how can we package it into the same solution that we have today and if we think about that graph in its, in its core, what does that mean? Well, if we look at an order, we can now take in an order from our traditional EDI partner, we can take in an order via a storefront, so we can take it in via our own website to a partner's website. Um, we can also connect into all marketplaces, so we can take an order in from Zalando, one in from Amazon, and it all flows in exactly the same way. Um, so if you've got a SAP system underneath that, a Sage system, and we've got connectivity for all of those, we plug those orders in in exactly the same way. You carry that message across for all of your transactions. That's how we're starting to attend to our customers' needs. This is just a, a, a graph, effectively. It's a, for those that played Trivial Pursuit, you're probably familiar with this one, but it's a, it's just a way of us showing, I guess, the, 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 the pieces of the pie um, that we've, we've added into the equation to try meet your needs. Or, and it may be that you don't need all of these. Very few businesses do need all of these. It's only really the big mature guys that, that, that have a long running uh, experience of this that have had to call on all of these pieces. You may need one or two, chances are you do. Um, and it, it's having the right solution to fit into that. And TrueCommerce as a, a, a multi-platform provider facilitate that effectively. So we can allow your, you to connect in with, with online shopping, plug it into your existing systems. Product information management, as I say, I, I think it's core to everything is that you're able to get the data out in a structured format to the places that you're selling your product um, and you're not doing that on a manual ad hoc basis because it's really hard to do. Um, we can facilitate that by putting in place a solution or a platform that will publish that data out as required by the, the, the parties on the other end of things. And we have experience with dealing with all the big players on that. Uh, inventory management. So yeah, great. I've got the order in. How do I manage that? How do I, how do I actually get it out to the consumer? So like that, we've got pack and ship available too. 
to to our customers and even the likes of data flows in and out to update the marketplace to let us know what stock is in there what what's available to buy what isn't available to buy new product lines getting that out there and we can publish that data through our our, our, our platform on it integration integration is a huge part of what true commerce do today um so we would always say that we're pretty agnostic to back-end systems so we will connect with any back office system that's out there that has a way to publish um data and so we work with apis we have direct publishers or even down to the likes of, of file-based transfer we can interact with most back-end systems and why that's important, I guess, is that you can have a really good front end and um, system or a really powerful back end system. If you can't join the two up, they're in isolation. They don't work. Um, and you're having to do a lot of manual processes really just to manage the flow between one another. Um, we, we like to step in and, and, and be that party that, that connects the two. Um, and then like that traditional stuff around customer service and all that, as you go into this online world, it's staying on top of it. So you're going to get a lot of requests in for where is my shipment? Um, have you got stock of this and all? How do I channel that? that is, is that not just going to create a workload that, that's unsurmountable for me? What we try to do is, for the most part is automate it. So the better quality data that you can send out to parties or the consumer on the end of things, the better, the less call for them to request information from you. So I would always say like that, we will help publish that information that you hold on your end of things out to the consumer so that they can effectively self-serve and, and, and be content with the with the results with, with the service that they get um, and then like that or, order management uh, critical to all of this is getting orders in nobody wants to invest into a system that means that they're not selling product we want to assist you with handling uh, handling orders from from every which way and um, we would see the success of our solution as being handling as high a volume of orders as you can possibly facilitate um, and, and them coming in from every which way. We don't care if orders are coming in from Amazon, they're coming in via websites, they're coming in through traditional EDI channels. What we want to do is help you grow your business by, by having no sort of, uh, no, no challenge along the way with fulfilling those orders. And I guess what I would like to say is, is thank you all for listening today. I would hope that we we started a conversation in, in, in your own head and we would encourage you to reach out to both GS1 and True Commerce to discuss further. If you have a challenge today or if there's been one on the, uh, on, the, on the periphery that's been nagging away at you for a while, please contact us. Um, we'd be very happy to have a conversation and, and see if we can help you more. Great. Thanks, Keith. And I suppose I'd offer the same if anybody has a question around the you know data, around barcodes, around... Uh, product information do feel free like to, to reach out and, and ask us a question you're very welcome thank you all uh, and i look forward to to speaking to you in the the near future bye thanks keith bye